Elections have consequences. In just seven months, we have seen the full force and effect of someone who cares more about politics and power than actually the country that they were elected to represent. Now, if you're watching this, I want you to call your family and friends. Seriously, have them turn this on. Turn the channel to this program because people need to hear the brutal honesty of what just happened in Afghanistan. Now, I'm going to make a lot of people really uncomfortable by saying this, but I, I really don't care because it needs to be said. If you voted for Joe Biden, you directly contributed to the situation in Afghanistan that killed 13 American soldiers, full stop. 13 American heroes who didn't have to die, 13 families that'll never be the same. Let's say their names. Kareem Nakori, United States Marine, Lance Corporal, 20 years old from Narco, California, okay? Nikoi was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, based in Camp Pendleton, California. He joined the Marines in 2019 after graduating high school. He was barely alive at 9-11. His family says he'll always want to be, he always wanted to be a Marine, and that he planned to make a career out of it. United States Marine Lance Corporal David Lee Espinoza, 20 years old, from Laredo, Texas. He had just transferred from Jordan to Kabul one week ago to help with the evacuation. Navy Corpsman Max Soviak, 22 years old, from Berlin Heights, Ohio. He was an honor roll student in high school and played football. His mother, father, and 12 brothers and sisters all in mourning tonight. Lance Corporal Riley McCollum, 20 years old, from Jackson, Wyoming. He was, his enlistment was on his 18th birthday, determined to serve in the Marines, and just got married earlier this year, then deployed to Jordan and was relocated to Afghanistan two weeks ago. Column's widow is pregnant with the couple's first child. She's due next month. Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz. He was 20 years old from Wentzville, Missouri, joined the Marine Corps shortly after graduating from high school in 2019 and was on his first overseas deployment. He, too, was relocated to Afghanistan just two weeks ago. Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole Lee G., 23 years old, from San Diego, California. She was assigned to a combat logistics unit at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. She was promoted to sergeant in Kuwait not long before landing in Afghanistan. Her husband, also a Marine. Staff Sergeant Darren Taylor Hoover, 31 years old from Midval, Utah, 11 years in the Marines. His family says he was inspired to join the military by the September 11 attacks. He was 11 years old when that happened. Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Noss, 23 years old, Coryton, Tennessee. He deployed to Afghanistan in 2017 with the 82nd Airborne Division, Bronze Star, Purple Heart. Corporal Hunter Lopez, 22 years old, from Coachella Valley, California. He joined the Marines shortly after high school graduation in 2017. He was planning on joining the local sheriff's department when he returned home from this deployment. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Dylan Morella, 20 years old, from Ranchero, California. He was a first overseas tour and due to return to the U.S. this month. Marine Corporal Dagan William Tyler Page was 23 years old from Omaha, Nebraska. He planned to go to trade school and possibly even try out for the NFL when his enlistment ended. Sergeant Rosario Picardo was 25 years old from Lawrence, Massachusetts. A supply chief with the 5th Marine Expeditionary Brigade, she was deployed to Afghanistan as part of a task force assisting the State Department in evacuating Afghans and Americans. She was a member of the brigade's female engagement team, a group of experienced Marines chosen to navigate del delicate and cultural issues within the Taliban. Marine Corporal Humberto Sanchez, 22 years old, from Logan Sport, Indiana. He enlisted after graduating high school in 2017 where he played varsity soccer, took honors, dual credit college classes, and was on the homecoming court. Here they are. Folks, most of these people are barely old enough to rent a car, but yet they're overseas serving on our behalf. They're the real American victims of Joe Biden's presidency. Now, people need to understand that this is what happens when you elect people that have 50 years of experience and no actual accomplishments to show for it. I'm talking to everyone, even members of my family. Okay, this is difficult for me. Because I'm talking to members of my family, too, who had the chance to elect somebody who projected strength versus someone who had been on the wrong side of nearly every foreign policy decision for 50 years. We must get away from the anonymity justification that, oh, my vote didn't do this. It did do this. If you voted for Biden, it did. 
There's no way to spin this as anything but a complete catastrophic failure. And if you voted for Joe Biden, you attributed to that. Let's take a step back, though. I want to look at the fact that they knew this was coming, and they still did nothing. This largely could have been avoidable. July 13th, that's almost two months ago, the State Department warned that this was likely the outcome for the, this type of course of action. And as reported in the Wall Street Journal, the State Department sent via, or the cable sent via the State Department's confidential dissent channel warned of rapid terrorist gains in the, by the Taliban in the subsequent collapse of the Afghan security forces and offered recommendations on ways to mitigate the crisis and speed up an evacuation, the two people said. Okay. So now John Kirby and the State Department are trying to spin this into something positive. In the course of a very short order of time, 122,000, the largest airlift that the U.S. military has conducted, uh, uh, got 122,000 people to safety. The numbers speak for themselves. 122,000 plus is that that is that is significant, and a, a lot of lives um, were saved, and a lot of lives are now in a better place. Trying to make it something positive. How about the ones that are still left there? You think this is some sort of political game, Kirby? You trying to save face? 13 American troops just died, and you want to somehow take credit for the poorly executing, the, the very job that you should have been doing in the first place. How about you just call it what it is? I'd have a lot more respect for you if you were just honest. This is a failure, and the measures put in place to make sure that nothing ever happens like this again are still not being taken. Instead, Kirby's up there proposing we should be patting him on the back for him somehow attempting to solve the problem that they originated. They created this problem. Since when do we care about how many people got out of the war zone? The only thing that Kirby should be saying right now is, you know, how many people are still out there? That's the question we'd ask. Is there one American left on the ground? But instead, their energy is focused on this. And, you know... In Kabul, private re rescue efforts grow desperate as time runs out. Eric Prince, okay, the guy who knows probably more about private contracting in, uh, than anybody in the world, he's done this on behalf of governments that everyone in the world has gone to him as the subject matter expert. He's one of these people working to these, these private efforts to rescue people. He did an interview this week and claimed that Biden administration has asked local governments not to cooperate with these private organizations, basically thwarting the only attempts at rescuing these people out in town right now. Now, I can tell you this is true. And you want to know how I know? Because I wanted to go. I tried every effort I had, every connection I had, every phone call I could make. I used every effort at my fingertips to get on a plane and go get our people. I was trained for this, probably better than just about anybody in the world. I did this in Iraq. And we had planes that were willing to fly us over there but nobody could get approvals to get us into country. The contractor groups I spoke with were dumbfounded why they were being blocked from helping get American people out of Afghanistan. Folks, let's take a walk down memory lane. Do you remember Dunkirk? It's important for the historical reference here. Dunkirk was the battle in World War II when the French port had been surrounded and was under imminent capture from like the Germans and the, all the civilians in England banded together to help extract over 300,000 Allied troops and civilian counterparts. These are civilians that took their personal boats and were willing to evacuate Allied soldiers. This is no different from the concept we're seeing now, and yet we our government is so stubborn and inept that they don't want anyone to make them look bad, so they just block anybody from doing anything. Kidding me? What, what sense does that make? This is the history that should be taught in our schools for the next 200 years. Because I want everybody to know what happened. Because this is the D.C. Beltway garbage that just got 13 Americans killed. I mean, listen to this. I'm regretting not starting the evacuation even a few days earlier. Who's that for, Idris? Either one. We, you know, we make plans for a number of things, and, and clearly, as Chairman pointed out, uh, we, uh, as we did detailed planning throughout, we recognized that there might be a, a, a point in time when we'd have to conduct a NEO. No. That was just a few days ago. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and General Mark Milley, he's the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, taking no responsibility for the disaster they helped create in Afghanistan. And let me, let me preface this by saying, 
If you didn't help create it, you should have resigned. If you thought this was a bad plan, you shouldn't have kept your position. You should have had some character and you should have resigned if you didn't like the plan, but you went along with it. And instead of playing this blame game now, there's, there's one group of highly trained U.S. military veterans that are taking matters into their own hands. They're retired Green Berets, there's some SEAL team guys in there, some of which I know, volunteering and secretly rescuing hundreds of allied operatives from Afghanistan. There's a week-long operation called Pineapple Express. Now, retired Navy SEAL and author of Trident, Jason Redman, who I had the fortunate opportunity to serve with a couple times. So, uh, Jason, you guys are actually part of the solution here when it doesn't seem that anybody else in our own federal government doesn't want to pick up the slack. You guys did. Tell us about what's going on. Carl, what's up, brother? Good to see you. And uh, yeah, over the last week, Task Force Pineapple was created and we have successfully accomplished uh, evacuating over, we estimate now, close to 700 Americans, Afghan veterans, interpreters, numerous VIPs, and uh, creating a one-of-a-kind uh, virtual underground railroad mechanism called the Pineapple Express. Yeah. Uh, just let me say here, if you need bodies, I'm ready, willing, and able to go. I'll be on a plane with you guys tomorrow. Um, I, I don't know what... Well, yes. Carl, it's funny you say that, because here's the reality. Now the hard work truly begins. And a lot of people have asked, you know, who is the pineapple? Who is Task Force Pineapple? Well, guess what? Americans can potentially be Task Force Pineapple because we have relied on a network across this world. Right now, this country, unfortunately, our government, for whatever reason, has decided they're not going to honor the promise to these people who supported us. There are so many Afghans who are stuck behind, who were promised by this government to be able to come home and lead a good, free life, not under the rule of this violent government, the Taliban, you know, terrorist group. I don't, I don't even want to call them a government that's in power right now. Regime. And, uh, and we, we need to honor that promise. So if you are, you need a question. If you're out there, I hope you will question what it means to be an American. Because, you know, when I grew up, it meant something special to be an American. It meant something if we said we were going to do something and we took care of those who took care of us. Yeah. So that's why the motto of Task Force Pineapple is honor the promise. And it's not about the right. It's not about the left. It's about no man is left behind. And right now, we've got a lot of people, including American citizens, who are still left behind. Yeah, and, and it doesn't seem like people are actually caring about it up at the State Department, up at the DOD. My, my issue here is the Taliban, we, we've essentially outfitted them. By the way, if you're a taxpayer, you have, on average, have contributed over $250 to the Taliban via weapons, night vision vehicles. They now have more Black Hawk helicopters than 90% of, of countries in the world all because of our tax dollars. Now, you know, Jay, you and I, have, you know, we were in Iraq together. We did a platoon uh, in, you know, sister platoons together. And I, from what I remember is we just blew up all the stuff we left behind. Why didn't they take those precautions at all during this withdrawal? You know, Carl, there's so many things that have been done that I just scratch my head and just don't understand. I mean, everything from why we gave up Bagram um, you know, to why our, our government and Department of Defense didn't, didn't decide to push security forces out into the city to allow safe passage for both American citizens and the Afghans, the vetted Afghans who we said we were going to bring home. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't understand these things. But I will tell you this. This is what people need to understand. There's a lot of people out there that are saying, well, we can't stay in war forever. And you're right. We can't. We can't run forever wars. But there are better ways we could have done this. And at the end of the day, if you remove the war component, for 20 years, we worked alongside individuals, many of which, in my opinion, are more American than half the Ameri or some of the American citizens that are out there. Mm -hmm. And we promised them we would bring them home. And that is not done. But so many people out there in America, they, they can't connect with this. When they think of Afghanistan, it's as far off land with mountains that, you know, just has nothing but terrorists. And <laughs> there is some truth to that. But the reality is there's a lot of great people, mm -hmm. people who sent messages like this. This is one of the families we got out. Names and locations have been changed. Hey, John, it's Bill. We're moving on the first leg to our unknown city in America. And I want to I want to know you. I want you to know, please come visit us. You saved my family. Anything you need. I'm forever here. We love you. These are people no different than your neighbors down the street, man. They supported us, right. and it's up to all of us to— you need to pressure your political leaders to do the right thing and honor the promise we gave these people. 
I 100% agree. You know, you and I both know Johnny Walker, who we were in Iraq with together. Uh, we had him on the program talking about this. He had a similar situation. That guy is more American than 90% of this country, even though he was born in Iraq and, you know, ra raised over there. And a lot of these interpreters, they were willing to turn their back for almost certain death on the Taliban and on whatever terrorist group there was. And we couldn't get him out of there. I want to, you know, I want to go over the fact that there was a, there was a negotiation that happened, and this has just come out recently in the last like two days here, where the American leaders said told the Taliban in closed doors negotiations, oh, we don't need the the city of Kabul, we just need the airport. And the Taliban was like, all right, fine, like. I guess we'll take the city. I mean, what do you make of these type of foolish negotiations that didn't allow us to have that per or keep that perimeter that we had previously already established? Once again, Carl, there's a lot of things that have been done that I just scratch my head and I don't understand. But at the end of the day, right now, my focus and the focus of Task Force Pineapple is to get the remaining American citizens and the mm -hmm. remaining Afghan allies out. I'm not going to point fingers right now because the reality is uh, it is almost it is very difficult for us to do this on our own without right. the support of the U.S. government. So all I can say is, please pressure your political leaders, reach out to them and just say, hey, we, we promise these people and we need to fulfill that promise. Yeah, I know. I'm Jason Redman. What you're doing is absolutely incredible. We appreciate it so much. And like I said, the offers on the table, anything I can do, I will be on a plane tomorrow if you need it. And anyone out there, if you want to help right now, you know, conducting these operations, moving to the next phase is going to take a lot of work. Please check out OperationRecovery.org. Uh, those funds will be utilized to try and help these people get out. All right. One, you know, one of the few groups out there actually doing what they're saying they're doing. Jason Redman, we appreciate you joining. Carl, thank you, man. All right. Hey, I'm Rob Finnerty. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, too. Hit the bell icon to be alerted to breaking news. And remember, there's a whole lot more on Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news network. Newsmax TV, where real news for real people.